guys agree that the most loved, well-liked, and respected people are those people who love to serve. Those people who give themselves more so than others, who lay their lives down to be a blessing for the betterment of other people. I remember back when I was first starting in the ministry, I was a youth leader. I was 22 years old and I was serving at a brand new Calvary Chapel at my uncle's church, Uncle Phil. I was at Uncle Phil's church serving. And there was one particular Sunday where, you know, I, I was hanging out with the youth. I was shepherding them and answering questions. And, you know, they have all these different home issues. And I'm, you know, just ministering to them. I also served that day in the audiovisual department. I think I did the slides, the, you know, pushing the buttons on the computer. And it was like a full day. And it was like, okay, I'm, I'm serving you, God. And I remember an announcement came uh, from the pulpit during announcement time that, hey, our children's ministry area just needs some tidying up, some clean, the walls need clean, the carpets, and we're, we're just asking for some, some volunteers after church to just stay behind and, and to serve. And immediately my heart said, no. I know I'm supposed to be there. I know Uncle Phil won't ask me to be there, but I'm the youth leader. I should be there. I should set an example. And my heart was a resounding no because I had made plans to go eat food after church and then go watch a football game. And this, you know, cleaning the children's ministry area was just a big violation to my sovereignty. <laughs> so church ended, and I'm, I'm over there, like, behind the computer, <laughs> and I see the group gather, and they, they, they walk back to the back, and I grab my keys, and I tiptoe, out the door, and I'm like, no one's watching me. I get into my car, I turn the ignition on, and I'm like, ha, ha, ha. no one knows, and no one cares. But someone did care because I heard a voice in my heart say, You're a jerk. <laughs> what? You need to get back in there. I saw youth group kids go back there. And I start having this wrestling match with the Holy Spirit. And I, I came to one of those moments where it's like, you know, when you win against God, you become a loser. When you win, you lose. If you let him win, you end up winning. Have, haven't you experienced that in life? When you win, you end up losing. And so it was about a five-minute thing, and he's like, jerk. And I'm like, I really want this food. And he's like, I want to make sure you have the worst plate. Your food's going to stink. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh. So after the guilt was just too much, you know, I turn the car off, I walk back inside, and 10 minutes later, I hold my calls, please, thank you, thank you, I'll talk to them later. <laughs> About 10 minutes later, I find myself scrubbing crayon off the children's ministry wall. And as I'm doing that, I get filled with this overwhelming sense of just love and, and satisfaction because I let God win and I ended up conquering the flesh and doing what God was calling me to do. I felt so much better having stayed and doing the thing I initially didn't want to do than if I would have just ran off and gone away. Now the question is, why couldn't I have just done that in the first place? Why couldn't I have just heard the announcement and said, oh yeah, I'll be there and I'm going to get the youth group kids to go too. I'll be, I'll be the first one there. Why couldn't I have done this? Why did I have to go through this wrestling match? I don't think I'm the only person who does these sorts of things, am I? I think we all do these sorts of things all the time. And all of these little selfish failures make it evident that you and I would much rather be served than be a servant. And yet, the most loved, well-liked people are those who love to serve rather than those who are always letting others serve them. All of us would rather be served than serve other people. Wouldn't you agree? We would rather watch someone wash the dishes 
than do the dishes. We would rather let someone else change the poopy diaper, men. You've all weaseled your way out of it at least one time if you're a dad. Where it's, it's on you, it's, it's your calling. The opportunity is before you. And you weasel and sneak your way out of it somehow, some way. Wives, I see you turning your heads. Don't do that. Not, you fight after church. Not now. We would rather have someone else who, you know, they have more time in their schedule than me to come early and help set up a church. Or, you know, I, I'm waiting for someone with a better personality than me to go and share the gospel with that person. And yet, when we see someone who's the opposite, when we see someone who serves sacrificially, those are the people who are praised and celebrated because we all see their good works, that they serve more so than normal people, and we love those people. We think those people are great, and we respect them because we see they're always giving a helping hand. So then, why is it so hard to be what we expect everyone else to be? Why is it so hard to be a servant even though we love and respect those who are servants? As we get into John chapter 13, I want to think about this with you guys today. John chapter 13, verse 1. The chapter begins and it says, Before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. A little bit of context. Remember, it's the day before Jesus is going to be crucified. It's the feast of Passover, which means Jerusalem was filled to the brim with Jews. You know, just overpopulated. The, the city swelled. and The Passover meant the priests were on the Temple Mount sacrificing and slaughtering lambs for the, the meal that was to be eaten, and so the fresh smell of blood was thick in the air, and what a reminder that would have been to Jesus about what he was about to endure the next day. He's wanting to eat the Passover, and he's going to talk to his disciples and, and teach them some awesome things, and it's just such a, a detailed moment, an intimate moment up in the upper room. It's not meant for the masses, it's meant for his disciples only, and that's why it's recorded for us here. In verse 1, it says, Jesus knew his hour had come. Remember, he kept alluding to this coming hour, and now it was here. He was going to leave them by dying on a cross, and it says, he loved his own until the very end. And think about it. This moment was all about him. Everything written in the Bible before this and after this was about him and this moment. It was all about him, and yet, all he can do is focus on loving these guys to the very end. And one of the reasons why we love and respect Jesus so much is because he's the greatest servant who ever lived. That's one of the reasons why he's so appealing to us. He rules the universe, and yet his heart is the humblest, and he is the lowliest servant of all. Remember, he said in Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 through 28, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In verse 2, it goes on, it says, Supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, back in that day, dudes wore sandals. You didn't have the modern conveniences of just being able to turn a dial and your shower comes on. These dudes had some nasty feet is the point I'm making. I mean, 
he's not going to some well-manicured toes. There's some snaggle toe going on some, somewhere. There's some fungus growing on some of those toes. There's some bunions that are just like, oh, my goodness. Can you imagine the scene? I mean, this, this isn't like a house. He is scrubbing. He is washing. He, he's getting them so clean. Because back in that day, to sit down at a dinner table was different than your dinner table. They would actually recline on their side on pillows. And you would sit in an angle. So by doing that, it meant that someone's feet were always pretty close to your head. So if we're going to sit down and have dinner, if I'm going to have dinner with some dudes, we're going to wash our feet. You know what I'm saying? Because we're going to have some nasty feet, and I don't want that stank in my face. Now, it was the job of the lowest servant to wash feet. It was considered a job only meant for slaves in some cultures. That if, unless you were a slave, you would never, ever succumb yourself to that degraded, humiliated position of washing someone's feet. And Jesus willingly puts himself in that position and begins to scrub away on these nasty toes. Something that's interesting about this is that John's gospel doesn't share this, but Luke tells us during this same meal, a dispute came up over who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So As these guys are arguing and seeking greatness among themselves, there's a good chance Jesus gets up to wash their feet in the midst of that discussion. Look at verse 6. Then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I'm doing you don't understand now, but you will after this. Peter said to him, you shall never, not a good idea to tell Jesus never, (laughs) you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? Maybe you're in a situation right now. And you wish God would just spell it out completely for you why you're going through what you're going through, why it's happening, why the timing of it, why isn't it ending. And Jesus might just sit there and instead of answering the question, he might ask you a question. Are you seeking to understand? Are you seeking God? Do you understand? It's a parable. It's It's a sermon illustration, what Jesus is doing. And he's so good at doing something strange and then asking a difficult question and then saying, I want you to figure it out because I want you to come up with the answer. I don't just want to tell it to you. I want you to discover it. I want you to learn it experientially for your own heart. I want it to sink in. I want it to mean something. I want you guys to think about it. I'm not just going to tell you. I want you to search for the meaning. What he's doing is He's told Peter, I I don't need to wash your whole body because you're already clean. But I do need to wash those feet. And spiritually, he's saying to you and to me, you're already clean. I've washed you. But because you have to go out and walk around in a dirty, fallen, sinful world, you need to get rewashed. You don't need to get saved all over again, all over. But yeah, the parts where you're exposed to this world, you need me to be continually cleansing and washing you. And he wants them to think about it. They begin to understand, uh, okay, guys, hold on. You know, a lot of times at dinner we joke around and everything, and, you know, this isn't the time to throw a French fry at the back of Jesus' head. He's, he's serious tonight. You know, the, he, he, something's up. Something deep's going on. So there's a seriousness to it now. And in verse 13, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, 
And you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. This is what Jesus wants them to realize. Jesus washes them. Jesus washes them. And then he tells them to be like him. First, he washes them. Then he says, be like me. He doesn't tell them, be like me, and then I'll wash you. He serves them first, and then he tells them to be servants. Only after they understood what he's done for them. Only after they understood all he is for them. Then, as you receive, now go be like me. And what he's doing is he's, he's really painting an amazing picture of salvation and Christian growth. Because when we're saved, we're washed by Jesus. We're washed by the water of the word of God. We're washed by the pureness of the gospel. And when that happens, God recreates our heart. That's why Christians become different. You can't help it because you got a true heart change. And it's now created in Christ's image, which means his nature is now implanted and imprinted within us. His nature's in you. And if his nature is in us, it means, don't miss this, it means we have been recreated to be like him. And who is he? He's a sacrificial servant who laid his life down for other people. That's the nature that is inside of you that's wanting to burst out in love towards other people. Jesus came down to earth to become a willing slave. He came to serve. And that's why he's the greatest in heaven, because no one outserved him. He has number one rank and authority, not just because he's God, but he proved it by being a good God and laying himself down in the lowest position he could have on the cross. So now that you're a Christian and this nature is within you, it means his desires begin to work inside of you. And as you serve, it becomes the proof and the evidence that Jesus has entered your heart. Love is the ultimate proof that somebody's a Christian, not how many Bible verses they can rattle off. Love is the proof. And God has defined true love as sacrificial service. So then... Why in the heck is it still so hard to serve? If we love and respect others who serve, and if Jesus has given us his desires to be a servant, then why aren't we jumping to be the first in line to sacrifice ourselves for the benefit of other people? Well, you have to understand something, and you have to understand biblically how this world functions right now. You have to remember that in the beginning, God created man in his own image, which means in the beginning, Adam and Eve had a perfect image of God. They'd never had a twisted thought about God. They saw him and they knew him perfectly as he is, and they never doubted it. But when Adam and Eve sinned, the image of God within humanity became marred. And over time, the image of God has become extremely polluted and corrupted. Look at the world we live in now. Look at the pain and the suffering and the injustice and the cruelty. It is because mankind has a marred, tainted, improper view of God. Some of them don't even believe he exists. Is how tainted it's become. And that has affected the world that we live in today. So instead of being sacrificial givers, because sin has entered into the world, we have become, all of us, selfish, greedy takers. That's who we are without Jesus. You might fake it and, 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 and do something to show someone that you were really sacrificial, but haven't you ever done something that looked good, but you had an alter agenda on the inside where it was really about you and for you? If you're honest, we've done that a lot of times. Our flesh nature is prone towards being selfish in every single area of our lives. Socially, 
financially, relationally, sexually, without the inward washing of Jesus, we are greedy takers in every one of these areas. And that keeps us from serving people. It makes us takers instead of givers. And that, haven't you seen it? That is the normal routine and story for so many people's lives. In a dog-eat-dog world, trying to get above, putting themselves at the center of the universe and building their own kingdom instead of building God's kingdom. But when the gospel comes into our lives, we're washed And Jesus puts his new nature in us. So now you have two natures coexisting within yourself. I wish as soon as Jesus came in, the old nature would be completely booted out of here. That's not going to happen until we get to heaven. So you have dueling, competing natures within you. Your old nature and your new nature. And although the old nature wants to be served, the spirit of God is at work within you and he's giving you new impulses. He's giving you the desire to serve and to give, the desire to be like Jesus in the way you sacrifice yourself for other people. And that's when you start to make new choices in life. You you, you start to have, before you didn't have the wrestling match in your heart. Before, it was just the first impulse, do what's going to benefit me. All of a sudden, Jesus comes in, and now you become this crazy schizophrenic. (laughs) Because now instead of one nature, you got two natures inside of you. We're always having a conversation with ourselves. You're always talking to yourself. I'm always talking to myself. And depending on the day, sometimes the ugly nature wins and sometimes the beautiful nature wins. But being a Christian and following Jesus is, you know, as you have these wrestling matches and you're like, you know what, okay, I'm going to put myself out there and I'm going to serve. I don't want to. It's not natural, but I'm going to do it. And you test the waters and you see how great it is. And, and, and you start to make a choice here and, and a choice there to serve And as you continue to follow Jesus in this way, the routine of your life begins to change, which means this, the story of your life begins to change. And it's a beautiful thing when you see the story of a life change and it's accredited solely to the power of Jesus Christ and the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit within the heart. That's a beautiful thing. In verse 16, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. So basically what Jesus is doing is he's saying, you guys call me Lord, you you call yourselves my servants, that's great. That means you will have no problem with me sending you to follow my example of being a servant now. You know, there's no begging. Jesus is not a used car salesman. He doesn't force them or manipulate them with a fear tactic. There's no lengthy appeal. He's secure in the fact of who he is and what he's got to offer, and it's the best package out there, that nothing's going to fill your heart more, that he, he doesn't need to beg. He knows that if you come back to the word of God and that as he continually washes you, it's going to ignite you into being a sacrificial giver and lover. He's secure. He knows that's going to happen. He knew it was going to happen in them. And it did. And they weren't perfect at it. But these 12 who became 11 men reshaped the entire world. because they decided to lay their lives down for the kingdom of God. And, 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 then, and then next up, man, in this next, I love how Jesus ends this section. In verse 17, Jesus says something absolutely revolutionary. He says, if you know these things, blessed, everyone say blessed. Blessed are you if you do them. Everyone say do them. He doesn't say there's a blessing if you know him. There's no blessing there. This is a conditional promise. It's conditional. 
There's blessing if you do them. So much of the Christian life is given to us for free, and it's not really earned. So much of it. But this is conditional. There is extra blessing if you do this. The word blessed in the Greek means, oh, how happy. Isn't what this, searching, this world's searching for is a little bit of happiness? I mean, in everything people do in their pursuits, they're wanting some happiness. Well, Jesus says, happy will you be if you do what I'm saying? It's one thing to know it, but something changes in your life, and something supernatural happens. And it's that the happiness of God himself, the reservoir of what is in God's own heart, begins to pour down into your soul when you do what Jesus says to do. It's very simple. The challenge is that it's hard for us to believe that fullness of joy and happiness will actually be experienced by me trying to make someone else happy. That is not natural, correct? You wrestle with that. I wrestle with that. You know, how, how am I going to be happy if I don't do what I want to do? How am I going to be happy if I have to sacrifice? Sacrifice is not a fun word. It wasn't a fun word for Jesus. How does this make sense? You know what it's going to take? For all of us to become who Jesus wants us to become, you know what it's going to take? Faith. It's got to be faith. You got to believe and do it without seeing it. Because once you start doing it, then you'll start experiencing it. Once you do it, then you'll start feeling it. And it takes faith. And the Bible tells us one way for us to get more faith. If you're like, well, I need some of that, Josh, because I don't got it. (laughs) The Bible says faith comes by hearing from the word of God. And that's what the washing is talking about. You keep coming back to the word of God. At church, you get the word of God in you. At home, you get the word of God in you. You're, you're, You're listening to the radio. Get the word of God in you. And you will get more faith. And this washing will take place. And you'll be a better follower of Jesus. And there's times, isn't there, where an opportunity to serve comes and you fight and you fight and you fight against it. And you don't want to do it. But at the end of the day, when you lay your head down on your pillow, you start to pray and you say, God, I'm so glad I didn't stay home. I, I'm, I'm, I can't believe that the simple thing I did brought a tear. Tears were streaming down those families' eyes. I can't believe I could actually be used to bring so much good and, and beauty to another person. This feels amazing. And you start to say, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry for being so selfish. I'm sorry I had to have the wrestling match. Why, why can't I just do it so naturally, so easily? I speak from experience. You see, I started off this message by telling you a story of where I did good. But believe me, there's many stories of where I've done the opposite. And I've disobeyed the convicting ministry of the Spirit. And I, I end up being selfish. And what, what happens when you do that? You don't feel good. When you get what you want, you feel crummy, you feel guilty, you got to go through that whole repentance thing. It's just, it's not fun. But when you serve people, there's, there's such a supernatural happiness. And that, that's why when Christians are suffering and going through hard stuff that they don't understand, there is something that is powerful that overrides those circumstances, that causes them to just keep serving God and, and keep loving God and keep loving people. And, and it's God. There's no other explanation for it than it's God at work. And they find a joy and they find a happiness that they shouldn't be receiving. That the world is not receiving. Because it comes from the supply that's found in God's own heart. Amen? God's happiness is reserved for his servants because Jesus is a servant. And happiness is something that originates from his own heart. We only know happiness because he first knew happiness. 
And there's nobody happier than God. There's no one who laughs like God. There's no one who knows how to party and get down like God. Because the happiest people are servants. Remember the first miracle of Jesus? The only people who knew about it were the servants. Only they got to see the miracle. Because that's his heart. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it says, Remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And I don't expect that to be something that is easy for you to get. Because it's not easy. It it, it is not easy to get. And that's why we wrestle. And if you're the type of person that when an opportunity to serve comes up and you don't have the wrestling match, and you're just like so spiritual that you just jump and you are the first person in line to serve and you love doing it, then, I don't know, the rest of us, we just, we kind of hate you right now. Because that's not us. But here's the thing, when you see those people, this is what's happened in them. At one time in their Christian walk, they did wrestle. You see? They kept following Jesus. And at one time, they they disobeyed God, and they disobeyed God, and finally, after all these chances, they finally took a step of faith to do something. And they realized, wow, that was really fulfilling. I can't, I can't believe I haven't done it since. And then, and then they took another little step to do something, and they realized, oh, my gosh, I'm tasting and seeing that God is good. And, 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 and the wrestling matches became less intense between them and God. And they finally just came to a point where they're like, what else would I do but serve you, God? And as they follow Jesus, they become like Jesus. Uh, I'm, I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way. I mean, there was a time when I told God, I will never be a pastor. I was Peter. I told God never. It's not a good idea to tell God never. I will not, I can't do, what are you, God, like, it would be foolish for you to put someone like me, you know, it's just all those thoughts were running through my mind, and I had to test it, and test the waters, and I found that, you know, God's good, and I'm still in process, be patient with me. So what are you supposed to take away from this story today? What, what are we as a church to do with this story? Is, is it time for the elders to bring out the big basins of water? Are we just going to have a big old foot wash and party now? I don't think so because I ain't washing nobody's nasty feet in this room. <laughs> I'm sorry, I love you, but I don't love your feet. That's not the lesson, is it? Here's the lesson for our hearts. Here's the lesson. Listen, listen, listen to this. Don't miss this. The disciples had already sat down when Jesus rose up to wash their feet, which means this. None of them were willing to do it. Do you know why? It was something that was beneath all of them to do. They were too prideful to do it. They were too into their own kingdom to do it. And as you think about that, what then are some things that Christians can tend to think is beneath them to do at church? What are things that just, it's just, you know, I just, I'm not going to do that. Is it setting up chairs? Could it be Tearing down chairs, putting in extra time. Maybe it's children's ministry. Maybe it's parking lot. I don't know. Whatever it is, listen, it's not beneath Jesus because he's a servant at heart. And you know what I see when I, I, I just saw a dude in an orange shirt going by, just directing traffic. I don't know, someone's coming late to church, I guess. When I see those guys out in 100 degree heat, I don't look at them and say, you know, they they have to do that where I get to be ministering in the air conditioning all day. You know what? When When I see guys out there directing traffic, I see Jesus. 
When I see guys lifting this heavy stuff up here, I look up and it's like, oh, there's Jesus. There's the hands of Jesus. There's the feet of Jesus. That's what I see. I see God's heart on display through these hearts that have let in him have his way. And they're joyful because of it. And they've learned that this, this church, this house has become a home away from heaven. It's, it's, it's be, they realize this is the kingdom of God on earth. It's a taste of it before we get there. And they're just going along with what he's putting it on their heart to do. The fruit of God's love will always produce sacrificial actions. And if sacrificial love is the chief characteristic of Jesus, then that's the kind of love that has to be present at this church every single Sunday. It must be present in you every single Sunday. Because this is what concerned Christ's heart the night before he was crucified. These men were about to go plant the very first church. And this is what was on his heart. One last verse, if you skip down to verses 34 and 35. I love this. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by, all, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is interesting because Jesus says, I have a new commandment for you. Love each other. And it's like, wait, hold up. That command's been around for a couple thousand years. Remember way back in Deuteronomy, God said, love your neighbor. So why is this new? Love people. It's because in Deuteronomy, God did not define exclusively what this love meant. He left it up for human beings, and we're pretty good at defining our own kind of love, right? We're pretty good at defining our own brand of Christianity and just kind of doing Christianity the way we want it. Well, when Jesus comes around, he says, well, let me clarify. <laughs> let me define this for you. Look again. He says, as I have loved you, as I have loved you, you must love one another. You see, the world had never seen a love like the cross before. And he defines the love that we must love with by his cross. Laying down our life, being sacrificial, that is much different. And if he does, look at what he says in verse 35. By this all, the whole world will know you're my true disciples. If you have this kind of love with one another. He, he's saying your community will be rocked. People will get saved. It doesn't matter what philosophy they hold to, what different religion they, it doesn't matter if they were born steeped into a contrary religion. If they walk into this house and they see this kind of love, they are going to be blown away because it is so different than what they've ever seen. And it, it's going to, it makes my job easy. It's like they're ready to get saved before they even hear the word of God because you're preaching the gospel to them by the way you love each other. It happened last week. Someone from a, a different faith base came to this church last week. And I was just told was just moved with love and received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Amen? Yeah. It's the love, guys. It's the love. I would love for this to become our church's theme verse that when we gather together as a church, we'd fulfill John 13, 34, and 35. That as a family united by Christ, it would be extremely evident to non-believers when they come in here, oh, you guys are different. This is much different than anything I've ever seen or experienced. And I would say, yes, it is, because you're watching the true kingdom of God in action. You're watching the kingdom of God touch down on earth for a, a few hours on Sunday mornings, and it is much different than the counterculture that's out there in the world. Well, I, I think about when people come to this church for the first time every Sunday, every Sunday. And I just, I want their experience to be that when they first drive up, the first thing they see is a smiling face. The first person they interact with, it doesn't matter who it is, it's a hello, hi, how are you? 
so greeted, to, to be made felt welcome instead of to be made felt weird or that I'm an obstacle to your guys' normal routine. To have my question answered, you know, I, I want all these things to happen, to be ushered if they have kids back there and that their experience as they get free coffee, or free donut, whatever it is, they would just come to a place that when they sit in here, they're like, man, it's safe back there in children's ministry. They got it down back there. It is safe. My kids are being taken care of. I, I can tell they're being loved back there. That's awesome. And I hope my little number doesn't get called on the top of the screen. <laughs> and, and I can come and I, I, I'm, I it, it just, the, the word of God is just the cherry on top after that. You know, they're, they're ready. The, the sense of, of, of love, as they say, my needs are being met. And as verse 35 is fulfilled, they're just the sense of love, the sense of grace, and that you're welcome no matter who you are, what you look like, what you smell like, what your past is. It doesn't matter. We're all on a level playing field, and we're all sinners that need the love of Jesus. Amen? That's who we are. That's who we all are. And they're gripped. And Jesus says, just a matter of factly, they'll know. You're the truth. You have, they'll know. By your love. As they see so many people participating to serve one another, and they see so much activity, and it's like, you're not getting paid for it. No one's forcing you to do it. They're not, fear, like, fear tactics aren't getting you. You just, you want to do this? Wow, something's real here that I need to check out for myself. That's how it's supposed to happen. So my call for this church today is that if you really, really listen if you really do want to be a part of a church where you get smaller and Jesus gets bigger, where it's not about you and an event you come to, but it's about the kingdom of God in action that you get to be involved in. If you want to come to a place where the word of God is taught and where worship is a celebration of what Christ has done and where forgiveness abounds, and if you want to participate and join us in doing and looking like the very first church in the book of Acts, then I got to tell you, you're at the right place. You're at the right place. And I want to thank all, all the servants here. I, I, I know who serves here because, I mean, Jesus said, you know, your good works will shine like lights before men. And people who serve here, they don't go around parading themselves. They, they just do what God's called them to do. But we all see it. We, we, we see Christ in you. I see Christ in you, and it's amazing at every level. I, in between services, I, I just like to walk around because I love to see the body of Christ serving itself, ministering to each other. It's like if, 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 it's like if, if my thumb is hurting, the rest of my body just doesn't say, well, just leave the thumb out there, and who cares? It's like, no, my other hand comes over, and it, like, it tries to help it, and to see the body minister and pray with each other, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing, you know. Pastor Eddie, our worship pastor, is back teaching Spanish service right now. It's great. You know, there's just so much going on, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. I thank you for serving. If you don't serve, or if, you know, if you've been thinking about serving, if you've been praying about serving, I want to talk to you guys. If God speaks to you and stirs your heart today about serving, then, you know, you need to know we're not needy. <laughs> God is not needy for you. Our church is not needy like we have to have people or it's just going to be crazy. That's just not us. You're needy. You're the one who has need. You're in need of becoming more like Jesus. You need that. And so pray about it. What is God up to in your heart? What is he speaking to you today? If you're interested, if you've been wondering, you know, how can I get plugged in, how can I serve, I want to tell you a very simple way to do it. Outside at Calvary Central, we have these ministry, I guess you call them brochures, pamphlets. I'd encourage you to grab these today outside and just take them home and pray over it. Because we have one for kids and students ministry, the production team, guest services. What happens when you open this up is there'll be a little section on why we do what we do reason behind the heart of, you know, serving, and it, it'll say in the middle, you know, set up or tear down, a greeter, coffee bar, 
parking lot, usher, security. And, and attached to each one of these volunteer positions is a little definition followed by the name and email of the person who heads up this ministry. And so as you look at it and just pray over it, you just shoot off an email and see what happens. Maybe it's going to be a fit, maybe not. But more importantly than that, when it comes to your daily life, it's, it's about you every day moving forwards or going backwards. And when little opportunities come up for you to serve, be obedient. Do it. If you have faith to believe that it's more of a blessing to serve than to be served. It's more of a blessing to give your life away than just to always be receiving. Then look for opportunities. Be intentional to serve. Be the servant in your workplace. Be a servant at home. Whatever the opportunity is, that's what following Jesus is all about. And that's how we show an unbelieving world about a loving, real God because he's at work within us as we do simple gestures of serving and blessing people. Here and there, little acts of kindness go a long way. Did you know this? There are people this week that are being rescued from committing suicide and killing themselves because of one simple smile and a polite, hi, how are you doing? Did you know that? Did you know that that alone, that act of kindness can actually save a life. We don't know what people are going through. I don't know what you're going through. But this world needs more kindness. It needs more of Jesus. And he's called this church to be a lighthouse, to be a beacon for a lot of hurting people in this community. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. Awesome.